Let's address the 800-pound gorilla in the room. <laughs> Opioids. Opioids. Right. Okay. Uh, many, many patients with sickle disease have chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Many of them are on opioids. Mm -hmm. My sense is they are not being treated well in terms of the perception of what they're doing with these drugs by the medical community and by the population at large. Is that yeah. fair? I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Uh, the, opi right. the opioid crisis just made it worse. You know, the bias that patients face when they go to the emergency room, you're a drug seeker, oh, here it is again. It just made it 100,000 times worse. You know, but when I had a panel of young adults, I took, as patients moved to the communities out and they go to where they live now for care, I, I took out a panel of young adults to meet with the community and they were really articulate. They, and then they were asking, what are the thing you want most? And this young lady said, I just don't want to be treated as when I get into the ER that I'm a narcotic addict. Yes. And that's what she said was the most important thing to her. I, I can't tell you the number of times that I, as a house officer, being called down to the ED, saw this. This is a patient I knew. This is a patient that we knew. And what I heard from the folks seeing her at the front door was, oh, she she's know, here there again. There she is again. It's stigma, and right? She's it's stigma. in pain, it's awful. darn it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. She has a painful disease. What's wrong with treating her? Th there's right. absolutely nothing wrong, and we need to get over that. And if you ask patients, they'll say to you, You're, you doctors are the ones that gave us exactly. opioids, right. and now you want to take them that when they were children, they did not ask for exactly. opioids, but over time, because of their, their tolerance levels, they've needed more and more opioids to get the same effect. We have done that as a medical community. And to now in the face of opioid crises and enhanced biases for whatever reason, to think that the right answer is to just simply take them away right. uh, is, is wrong. It's not that fair. Is, it's cruel. It's cruel. It is it's cruel. Not fair. It's right. unthinking, it is, cruel. It is un inhuman. And, and if another thing patients will tell you is, yeah, when I go to the emergency department, I am seeking drugs. I'm seeking help. Yeah. I'm We're seeking pain, pain treatment. I'm but yeah. I'm not addicted to drugs. Exactly. Yeah. I'm is seeking there, help. Are there options for these folks other than chronic opioids? Opio that most patients are not getting daily chronic opioids. There's a, the disease has a variability. And those, there is a subgroup, a small subgroup of patients to go to the emergency room that make up the majority of emergency room visits that, and there's a much larger group that rarely go into the emergency room, but the emergency room people see these few all the time. And then the, and a subgroup of patients in practices are on chronic pain meds, but I would not um, underscore, even in the older population, that everyone is on chronic methadone and opioids. There's a lot of people that are not most, in my opinion, but there is a subgroup that's similar to other chronic illnesses. So I, what I'm really concerned about is the inappropriate withdrawal, not you know, saying we're not going to treat you, basically. We're not going to give you this, but we're not, and we have nothing else to do exactly. for you. Exactly. Well, and our exactly. ED colleagues, right, are really stuck because yeah. they're not the ones who know these patients. They're not the ones who can design what their treatment plan should be. And so the real key is, is getting these patients plugged into high quality care so that someone can manage their opioid therapy appropriately right. and develop appropriate treatment plans when they go to the ED. It makes life easier for everyone. I mean, take a look at opioids and their risk profile. Uh, other than dependency. If you want to substitute, for example, an NSAID, good luck with their renal toxicity and other toxicities. I, I'm going to vent for just one more moment. I hate that. I hate the fact that these folks who have a real disease and are in pain get treated that way. I've hated it for 30 years, mm -hmm. and I hate it the same now as I did then. Well, it's really much worse now because it's validated doctors who don't want to see the patients. That's right. Now give say, them a reason. Well, now I don't, yeah. I don't treat I don't give narcotics, so I, you don't come to my ER. And so there are large, there are ERs I'm very familiar with that have made decisions. We're not giving it to anybody there with sickle cell. And so the pa you, if you track where the patients are going, they act, you can actually indicate where they go. It's, it's actually enabled people who didn't want to see them to get to have a reason not to have to see them. I absolutely agree with you, and it's not just provide healthcare providers. It's even on the pharmacy side. Patients can go to a pharmacy with a legitimate prescription, verifiably legitimate prescription, and they can be refused. All I know is when I graduated medical school, I took an oath to help people. That's right. That's right. And not helping these folks is criminal in, in, in a very, in, not in the medical legal sense, but in the 
the ethical sense. It's just wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, the healthcare system sets up these doctors in part that they, they are not enforcing or providing infrastructural um, um, programs to take care of them in their health, and they're shifted into this unorganized, undertrained ERs of places where people who are burdened see a few and they're not gone through. And the whole system, you know, if this was cancer or, a, or a hemophilia or cystic fibrosis or another disease that has similar or even less morbidity, there would be, this issue wouldn't exist like this. You know, the docs, the docs are sitting there, and, and I can put myself in their position. Oh my gosh, if I start giving out all these narcotics, somebody's gonna look at my prescribing habits, come after me, and I'm gonna be on 60 minutes. I probably prescribe the most opioids in the state of Connecticut. Nobody's looked at me. So I just, I don't buy that. I, you know, I, I don't. You can set up legitimate practices with good, um, with good contracts in place, screening measures to look for um, unexpected uh, other substances in the urine. Yeah. But I will tell you, even that in our own practice is very rare. But well, but the other that. piece, well, and the other piece, though, is that if you're a community hematologist, oncologist out there, right, it takes a lot of resources to take care of these patients. In our pediatric world, right, there's child life and there's social workers and this, but that, that doesn't exist. Yeah. Beyond that the infrastructure opioids, you're doesn't saying. Exist. Beyond Even the beyond the opioids, yeah. but it makes the prescription of opioids more difficult yeah. when it's just you and the patient.